We're going to be in Esther chapter 4 this morning as we continue our study through this great Old Testament book. Esther chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. And went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hatak, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Hatak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hatak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hatak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, There is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf. And do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. We ended Esther 3 last week with that sense of impending doom, that not-in-your-stomach moment when the Jews were informed that Haman had devised a plan to annihilate all of the Jews in Persia. And in chapter 4, the question is, what is now the response to this horrible news? There is always a moment after you are given bad news. And in that moment, after the bad news, decisions have to be made about the future. If it's a cancer diagnosis, one begins the process of scheduling meetings with doctors to come up with a treatment plan. If it's the loss of a job, you begin reaching out to your friends and your network of influence to try to find another job. And in our text today, Mordecai and Esther begin the process of taking action based on what they have just found out at the end of Esther 3, that the Jewish people, barring a miracle, will all be eliminated in Persia. God, however, 
is always faithful to the covenant that he made with his people. And because God is faithful to his covenant people, we can know without a shadow of a doubt that whatever happens to us, good circumstances or bad circumstances, will ultimately be used for God's glory and our good. So in Esther 4 today and the weeks following as we continue to study this book, know that because God is faithful to his covenant, what happens here to the Jews will ultimately work out for their good and God's glory. So as we work our way through the text today, we see three things. Number one, a distraught people. Number two, a plea for help. And in number three, a courageous queen. A distraught people, a plea for help, and a courageous queen. Number one, a distraught people. The initial response that we see from Mordecai is a perfectly natural response in this day. It makes no sense to us because when we mourn, we do not rip our clothes off, at least I don't think you do, and put on sackcloth and ashes. However, in the Jewish day in which Esther is written, this was a very common way for people to mourn. In fact, throughout the Old Testament, sackcloth and ashes is used regularly. We see it in Numbers 14. When Caleb is mourning the fact that the Israelites would rather return to Egypt than go into the promised land. We see it in 2 Samuel chapter 1 when David mourns in sackcloth and ashes the loss of King Saul. We see it in Ezra when he finds out that the Levites and the priests had been intermarrying with pagan Gentiles. So in Jewish history, when one receives horrible news, the response is to mourn in sackcloth and ashes. Even the Persians themselves acted this way, we're told in history, when they lost a very important battle to the Greeks. So this is not just a Jewish way of mourning. This is a way of mourning that took place across the ancient world. And we're told in this chapter that Mordecai not only mourns in sackcloth and ashes, but he goes out into the midst of the city to do so. And he's not doing this to create drama. He's not doing this for people to say, oh, look at Mordecai. He's doing this to set an example for all of his Jewish brothers and sisters in Susa. Because Mordecai was a leader in the community. And so because he was mourning in sackcloth and ashes, we're told that as far as the decree that the king had written to destroy the Jews could reach, the Jewish people responded the same way that Mordecai responded in this passage. We're not told exactly how far or how many provinces this decree reached in verse 3, but we know, based on chapter 1, there were 127 provinces that King Ahasuerus was responsible for. So Mordecai setting this example of mourning and sackcloth and ashes... He was setting an example for all of the Jewish people to imitate. But there's one very important word that is used in chapter 4. In fact, you could characterize it as a word that was very similar to how our service was structured today. And that is the idea of lament. Moments ago, Nick prayed a, a beautiful prayer of lament. We're told here in Esther 4 that the Jewish people are lamenting what happened to them. What does it mean to lament? There is an excellent book written during COVID, so it kind of got lost in the shuffle, called Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy. And it is an explanation of the biblical concept of lament. And a prayer of lament, simply put, is a prayer of pain that leads to trust in God. And if you go and you begin reading the Psalms, out of the 150 Psalms that we have collected in our Bible, 65 of the 150 Psalms are prayers of lament. 
Why is that so important? It's important because God actually wants us to bring our pain before him. See, oftentimes we have this kind of pop theology idea that when we gather to church and gather for worship, that we should always be on our best behavior and always be happy and always sing songs that leave us on cloud nine. But if you read the Psalms, you will find that many times God's people are lamenting. They are in pain. They are hurting about the circumstances that are taking place in their life. So when we pray prayers of lament, we're doing it because the church of Jesus Christ needs to lament together. We need to pray for one another when we lose loved ones. We need to cry out to God when we are frustrated about the things that we see happening in our neighborhood or in our country or around the world. And the elements of lament, specifically a prayer of lament, are this. Four key elements of a prayer of lament. Number one, we turn to God in prayer. Do not avoid God in the midst of your pain and suffering. Go to him. So number one, we turn to God in prayer. Number two, we actually bring our complaints before him. You already know that God knows everything, right? So if you go before him in prayer with your heart clearly broken and you don't express those emotions to him, you're not fooling him. He already knows everything about you. So you bring your complaints to him. Number three, you ask boldly. And then number four, you choose to trust in him or you choose to praise him regardless of your circumstances. So if God found it important enough for 43% of the Psalms to be laments, then it is equally important for us as a church to pray those types of prayers, both corporately and in our personal time with the Lord. In the context of Esther, the people are lamenting. They are complaining to God about their situation. They have just been told at the end of Esther 3 that they're going to die. That Haman has devised this evil, wicked scheme to destroy all of the Jewish people in Persia. And while God, we know, is not explicitly mentioned in the book of Esther, he's, they're almost certainly crying out to him in these moments, even though his name is never mentioned. All of the wailing and the weeping and the tearing of clothes, sackcloth and ashes, lamenting, all of this eventually finds its way back to Queen Esther through her servants and her eunuchs. And she attempts to send Mordecai clothes so that he will take off the sackcloth and end his mourning. But Mordecai refuses those clothes. And this is significant because in some ways Esther is trying to rush Mordecai as he grieves. Now I'm no professional counselor, but we all know That you cannot rush the grieving process for any individual. People grieve at different rates and they recover at different rates. And this attempt by Queen Esther, with good intentions, was rejected by Mordecai. And when he rejects these clothes, he is communicating to Esther, I'm not ready to move on. I'm not ready to forget what I have just found out about what's going to happen to God's holy people. Most commentators also point out that it is in chapter 4 when we see some key changes take place in the relationship between Mordecai and Esther. Up to this point in the story, Mordecai has kind of been the one taking charge. But in chapter 4, we're going to see this change. Because by the end of chapter 4, Esther becomes the one who is calling all of the shots in this story. But at this point, Esther has been living in the comforts and the peace and the luxury of the palace while Mordecai is sitting at the king's gate mourning the fact 
that he and his people will soon perish. They are distraught. They are a people in need of serious help. And so number two, we learn about that plea for help. Esther summons Hatak, which is actually not one of her eunuchs, but one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed to take care of Esther. She orders him to go and talk with Mordecai so that she can figure out what exactly is going on. And in verses 6 through 8, Mordecai and Hatak are conversing about this plan that Haman had constructed to annihilate all of the Jewish people. Mordecai even gives a copy of the decree so that Hatak can take it back to Esther so that she might plead with the king on behalf of her people. And when Esther receives this news from Mordecai, she isn't too excited about helping. Look at verses 10 and 11. Esther spoke to Hatak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. Now there's a lot to read into what Esther just said there. She hasn't been with the king in 30 days. She's the queen, and yet she has not been invited in to spend time, in quotes, with King Ahasuerus. What does this mean? That means just like we read in Esther 1 and Esther 2 about Ahasuerus could call any woman in whenever he wanted to do with her as he wished. It has been 30 days by this point that the most powerful woman in all of Persia has been invited in to spend time with King Ahasuerus. She has even lost her place of influence in his life. And Esther knows that to barge in and talk to the king is not only asking her to violate the law, but it will almost certainly bring impending death to her. Mordecai, however, is not sold with Esther's response. So he sends word back to her yet again in verses 13 and 14, which, by the way, are probably the most well-known verses In the whole book of Esther. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther. Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come into the kingdom for such a time as this. Now most people, even if they haven't done a deep dive into Esther, know this passage. It seems to be one of those texts that people often use to boost their self-esteem, make themselves feel good. It's a popular message that we often find in prosperity gospel churches and self-help churches. It's the kind of text that often leads people to believe that they can run through a brick wall. I actually want to do the opposite this morning, by the way. I want to discourage you for a moment. I'm kidding, actually. But this might be discouraging. I'm not sure. If you look at verse 14 and you read yourself into the text, you are missing what this text is saying. Esther 4.14 is not about you. It's it's not about me. In fact, Esther 4.14 isn't even ultimately about Esther. You know who it's about? It's about the God who uses Esther. When we read the Bible primarily through the lens of I we are in large part missing what God is doing when he reveals himself to us through his word. The Bible is not about you. The Bible is about God. It's the story of God redeeming humanity to himself through his son, Jesus Christ. Is there application for us in the Bible? Absolutely. 
But we are not the main character of the Bible. Abraham is not the main character of the Bible. Moses is not. Joshua is not. David is not. Solomon is not. Peter is not. Paul is not. The Bible is about the triune God making himself known to a people who are in desperate need of salvation. That is what the Bible is about. So brothers and sisters, I hate to burst your bubble, but more than likely, you will not be used by God in the same way that he uses Esther in this passage. You are probably not going to be used to save an entire people group from mass annihilation. So that moment for which God has called you to be the person that he wants you to be, more than likely, is simply to be a faithful Christian. In whatever avenue God has placed you in. And you know how you become a faithful Christian? You become a faithful church member. You read God's word daily. You pray regularly. You give generously. You love your neighbor as yourself. You love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. There's no need to get discouraged when God doesn't give you this great big assignment. Because being a faithful and obedient Christian is a hugely important assignment. It's what we're called to do. Would you like to see lost people that you know saved? Would you like to see whole nations come to faith in Christ? Abide in Jesus Walk in the Spirit and do the basic things that God in His Word tells us to do. And whether that leads to thousands coming to faith in Christ or only ten, you have been faithful and obedient to what it is that God has called you to do. So, God might use you for such a time as this to do something wonderful But more than likely, he's calling you to just be a faithful Christian. Get up, go to work, impact those that you know, proclaim the gospel as he gives you opportunity to do so, give generously, and be a faithful and committed church member. That is being a hero of the faith. High school, college students, young adults, the goal of your life is not to make tons of money so that you can have a beach or a lake house and coast into retirement. Adults, that's not the goal of your life either. We should throw that dream into the fire. That is an American lie, not a biblical goal for your life. Be a committed, faithful church member and allow God to use you in all of the different spheres of influence you have. Maybe God has brought you to this moment for such a time as this, in quotes, which means to be a regular, faithful, ordinary, and possibly non-exciting church member. And even if you were to do just that, you have been obedient and you will receive a crown in heaven for following faithfully after Jesus. So this plea for Esther, within the context of Esther, is very important. God has clearly set apart Esther for this moment. He has designed her and created her for this very moment. To go in on behalf of her people and plea for their safety and for their lives. Which requires Esther, number three, to be a courageous queen. So after Mordecai challenges Esther, she actually responds at this point. And she steps up. And Esther is now the one in charge. The the tables have changed. From this point forward, Mordecai is not the leader. It's Esther. Mordecai will now do what Esther tells him to do. Look at 16 and 17. This is the first marching orders that Esther gives Mordecai. Go, she says, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away 
and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Esther had a decision to make in this moment. Would she turn her back on her Jewish roots and remain in the comforts and the luxury of the palace? Or would she sacrifice not only her comfort, but potentially her life in order to save her people? See, Esther had a choice in the moment of where her identity was going to lie. Would she be a Persian or would she be a Jew? Would she serve and bow down to pagan gods or would she choose to worship the one true God, no matter what it might have cost her? She's not just deciding in this moment whether she will save the Jewish people. More importantly, she is deciding in this moment who she's going to worship. She's putting her life on the line. She's made the decision that even if she perishes, her allegiance will be to Yahweh and to his chosen people. That is why Esther is a courageous queen We should not be impressed with her because she rose from nothing to become the richest woman in all of Persia. We shouldn't be in awe of her beauty. We shouldn't be jealous of the many servants and eunuchs that waited on her hand and foot. The reason we should respect and be in awe of Esther is because she made a conscious decision to put her identity as a follower of Yahweh on the line. Even at the expense of her life. And as we get to the end of chapter 4, as the Holy Spirit always does when we read God's word, we see this character Esther and we realize that the Holy Spirit actually is pointing us in this passage to someone greater than Esther. You see, Esther runs the risk of experiencing death If she sticks her neck out for the Jewish people. But Jesus did experience death for sticking his neck out for his people. Jesus is the better and greater Esther. Esther could only save her people from physical death. But Jesus saved his people from spiritual death. Apart from him forever in hell. Esther could not do that for God's chosen people. It is Esther who will later in the narrative plead with the king to save her people from death. But Jesus intercedes for his children before the father daily. Esther is willing to violate the king's law in order to save her people. But Jesus kept the law perfectly in order to save his people from their sins. Esther throws herself at the mercy of the king where he will ultimately spare her life while Jesus throws himself at the mercy of the king of kings and cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And his life is not spared and God does not come to his rescue on the cross. Esther brings deliverance to her people, but for us today, the question is, who will bring deliverance to us from our spiritual bondage. Who will do it? Is Esther capable of freeing us from spiritual bondage this morning? No. Listen to this quote. The answer is Jesus Christ, the true mediator between God and man. In the fullness of time, he took flesh and appeared in this world, far from being comfortably isolated from his community as Esther was, Jesus identified with us fully. He took on the form of a servant and lived as one of us in this fallen and sin-sick world. Then, after he had completed his life of perfect obedience, he went in before the Father, knowing that he was not just risking his life, but laying it down. For him, if I perish, I perish, meant not just the potential probability of death, but the absolute certainty of the cross. As we continue on our journey of Esther, from this point on, when you see Esther, the Holy Spirit wants you to know that there is a far better and greater 
and faithfuler, is that a word, Esther, that exists, that came, that lived the perfect life, that violated no law and yet died to spare his people from their sins. So while we are grateful and inspired by the courage of Queen Esther in this passage, passage, we should be grateful, inspired, and ultimately bow down in worship to our King Jesus. Let's pray. Father, while we are grateful for Esther's courage in this passage, to willingly say, if I perish, I perish, it leads us and reminds us of the beauty of Jesus' death for his people. Jesus is the better and the greater Esther. Who is not spared, but gave up his life so that any that repent of their sin and place their faith in Jesus can be set free from spiritual bondage and corruption and reconciled to a holy God. Far more important than having our lives saved physically is having our souls saved spiritually. And because of that, we worship the King of kings and Lord of lords, today. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.